This is the launch station, the only place you need to look for all things onboarding, implementation, and customer success. Tune in for insights from industry experts every week. Hi, everyone. Welcome to a new episode of The Launch Station. Today, we're discussing how to get things going your way right at the start of a customer onboarding project with our topic, starting every engagement, putting your best foot forward. Our guest for the day is Deepak Kumar. Deepak is a veteran of over two decades in the enterprise software industry. He currently serves as chief customer officer of Aryaka Networks, and his key focus areas are to enhance the quality and experience of their customers globally and identify new solutions that will elevate enterprises to the next level of digital transformation. Prior to that, he was SVP and GM at 24-7 Inc. Deepak, we're glad to have you on our show today. Thank you. Thank you. Glad to be here, uh, Sri. This is a very interesting topic and a topic that's close to my heart. So glad to be chatting with you about this. Uh, we'll start off with an icebreaker. What would be the three things that you would carry the first time you meet a customer and why? As I think about it, I don't know. Um, would I carry something to a customer? Perhaps no. Um, I'm, I'm, you know, when I, when I go to a customer uh, to meet them for the first time, the three things that I would carry is more a deeper understanding of their business in itself. I mean, I don't know if I carry that, but I certainly will uh, have it in my mind. I also you know, try to um, understand a little bit more about the individual, some of the things that they have done. And the Third thing that I do is whichever city that they are in, I try to get a better understanding of the sports teams that operate there and get some facts. And again, more of it to build, to explore some uh, connection. And I tend to be a little more flexible. When you go into the office, generally you'll see into somebody's office, they will have some memorabilia about their favorite sports team, generally, all right? Uh, and so I try to pick that up. I would go within a certain mindset that, okay, if somebody is in, you know, Chattanooga, Tennessee, they're likely to be a Tennessee Titan footballs uh, team uh, fan. But then if I go and see a Denver Broncos, you know, memorabilia on their, in their office, then I sort of reorient myself to say, okay, this is person is going to be in this. And so, and I am a big fan of sports and I follow every sport. So it's, I try to see, make a connection on that because it is very helpful as an icebreaker when you engage with a customer. I don't usually carry something. Used to do it very early on in my career, but I don't know. Now I don't. You got it. When, when you said sports team, that actually reminded me of a very uncomfortable position I was in once where there was a lunch table at which I was sitting where everyone was talking about ice hockey and I don't follow the game at all. They, they, I was like just silent throughout wondering what, how I can contribute to the, to the discussion in any meaningful way. <laughs> yeah, you know, Shri, um, I, I can certainly relate to that, right? Um, you know, when I first came to the country, uh, what, 20 odd years, a little more than 20 odd years ago, 22 years ago, I had no idea about NBA no idea about NFL and it's hard to build a, a connection with the customer just on the, I mean, you've got your product and your value and what you're bringing to the table, that's your basis, but you need to build a social connection and that's very important. Deepak, what have you observed has changed in client servicing and customer success in the last decade or so? Look, that's a very, very interesting question, right? First of all, the advent of SaaS changes the definition of client servicing and customer success radically. And in many ways, you know, the, the assumption set that existed in enterprise software specifically prior to SaaS as to the time to value component, uh, they had a very, very different, you know, it's almost like night and day, right? I mean, if you thought of your traditional enterprise software, like, a, you know, the old, good old CRM, you would talk about it as 12, 18 month, 24 month deployment cycles. 
that doesn't exist anymore. Even if you were implementing a large scale CRM migration today, and let's say you were ripping out your existing CRM and putting in a new CRM, the parameter on time to value has, I mean, the time duration that you think about it as, you don't think about it as, oh, I'm going to implement this for 36 months or 18, 24 months, and then I'm going to see the value at the end of that. That doesn't exist. You'll say, I will deploy a few modules and I want to see the value right away. And so in many ways, the time to value domain, as well as the engagement domain with the customer has come to a different point. Earlier, let's say if you were doing an 18 month, you could be messing up the project for six, nine months. The customer starts to even get a feel for what's gone wrong nine, 12 months out. Here, you don't have that luxury. I mean, in a way, it's great for customers because they get to see it right away. In you know, three weeks, two weeks, you'll start to see the the early trends, and that places a very very different emphasis from customer success, value definition, value delivery. The time frame is compressed, so you you can't you can't sit on your backside and hope that you know nine months later I'm going to pick up the thread. That's gone, and I think that's very profound in my view how customer expectations have changed. And that means us in the domain of customer success or you know, in, in the customer engagement now have to be ultra sensitive to that expectation. And you can't forget that. Uh, I think that's a fundamental shift. It also means that your engagement with the customer has to be far deeper, right? Earlier, I mean, we used to hear horror stories on enterprise software, especially where the seller sells something and goes away, right? And you do not know whether the customer has got the value. He doesn't care. He or she doesn't care, right? That again, because the value comes out very quickly or the lack of value comes out very quickly, you don't have places to hide. So you have to be very clear about what you're selling as value to the customer and be able to back that up whether it is usage or whether it is, you know, adoption of the platform or whether it is uh, engagement on the platform, any of those dimensions, it's immediate. And that is, again, changes the dimension. And so your conversation with the customer quickly has to come down to what value am I adding to you versus features, et cetera. First, you got to cross the value barrier. And that's a, that I think is, profound. This decade, we've seen that 2020, I mean, 2010 to 2020 was something that you will say that was one huge shift that you've seen. Right. I guess even those who were like selling perpetual licenses in the past are all moving to SaaS, which means they need to depend on that strong engagement for, for their renewal to happen because yeah. it is, as you said, also easier to move out now because everyone else is also saying, hey, you know what? Three months, you'll start seeing value with me. Yeah, right? absolutely. So, uh, in fact, you know, I, I remember talking to somebody at Splunk. He was the CTO at uh, uh, Splunk and he was the CTO of my previous organization. A uh, very interesting dimension that he said, Splunk in its first generation had the luxury to go and say, It'll take six months for you to see value, nine months to see value. When we started moving into the SaaS domain, we were getting hammered by more nimbler competitors who would come and say, I'll be able to show you value in two weeks, right? And that, that, that just changed the dimension completely in terms of what you could tell the customer. And this is, you know, one of the largest enterprise software companies who has made a successful transition to a, a SaaS model. And they were sort of put on notice. They made the transition great, but you can still see that you could get hammered if you are not focused on creating that value soon enough. Deepak, I mean, we talked about these two dimensions in, in the last decade. Uh, what do you believe is next over here? What's the next big wave? 
The big wave is, see, uh, again, um, you have a set of software SaaS companies that are selling to business users. Uh, and when the ex uh, usage expands to a larger, it goes into the CIO domain, right? That, that used to be a fairly long cycle. You know, all the, the great software used to, I mean, if you see some of the bigger names, used to start in one small business domain and then rapidly expand into being the platform for that company or that enterprise. That used to be a few years. Now you're starting to see enterprise software companies to, that are able to get from initial usage to being the platform of choice much shorter, right? And I do believe that again is a, seems like a subtle change, but it's a transformational change. Um, in, in just in terms of, if you are a SaaS vendor, your outlook on how you engage with the customer and what you want to drive as value and what you want to drive as revenue growth or uh, ARR growth, um, I think is very different. The, the lens with which you look at the problem, earlier you used to say, okay, I'm going to play in this division for six months and then I'm going to do. The CIOs are getting more anal about getting control of these enterprise software in as much as they're allowing flexibility to the business owners, they want to know whether this is the platform of choice for me or I don't want to be in it, right? So right. that window is narrower uh, for you to make it big or go home, go big or go home, which means you're going to see companies growing at a much faster rate because if they're able to crack that puzzle, whether it is the onboarding, value delivery, all of that, that dimension, if you're able to crack it, you'll grow at a rapid pace. And that's a phenomenal opportunity because yes, we're still very early in, this, in the enterprise software sort of cloudification cycle. So you could see a large section of companies becoming world beaters in much shorter span than say what a Salesforce took to become or even a, you know, Workday or service now, any of these guys, they took if they took 10 years to get there, you can see a three-year window now. And that's phenomenal. I mean, if you are an enterprise software vendor now, your world is really your opportunity. Because you have now the ability to knock somebody off in much shorter time. I I think that's that I look at it and say, wow, this again, you'll see a new class of companies that you didn't believe existed. And I think the other dimension is the whole API, you know, APIification of the the whole software space. I think that's again another sort of microservices or however you want to call it. Instead of monolithic software, can I be more service or I mean API driven? I think that's another sort of fundamental trend, which I think will be big in this decade. Cool. Uh, before we deep dive into, uh, you know, how to take off any onboarding project, could you talk a little bit about why you believe implementation projects and deployments typically fail? Implementation projects, is, and I'm going to talk in the context of sort of the SaaS or the subscription domain, right? Um, they fail because primarily two reasons. One, you don't have a solid onboarding process, right? You might think, hey, look, it's SaaS software. I'm going to set up some users and boom, you go. Well, that is true, but you got to get the customer org to be ready to consume you. Even though you've created the software that is excellent and usable, the customer behavior has to be aligned or the customer has to be ready to consume it. And that's what I think is, is important and even if I look back at my experience, where we've succeeded well is where we've created that alignment well. Um, the second thing I think is, if it's a large enterprise that you're going after and it's a long sales cycle, let's say it was a nine month sales cycle, there's a bit of a hoorah moment that happens when the contract gets signed and you sort of take off your eyes out of what needs to be done. I mean, all of them, all of them will say, oh, the real work starts now. 
but instead of mentally you lose that energy and intensity it sort of takes you take a back seat because that's also the time when there are individuals who are changing right there are new set of individuals who are coming in during the implementation versus in the sales cycle i mean there'll be some overlap and there'll be some continuity and or in some cases quite a bit of continuity but the person who takes on the baton is changing and also the the individual who's on the sales side or in the pursuit side sort of loses that ah i got the deal now right and i think that's a that's a very very important transition to manage and onboarding is that management even on the client end you see that they've gone through a massive rfp process or a massive you know poc all of that and they're like okay now somebody else is going to come and run this and then there is that little bit of okay we've got this when it no it's actually you got to be almost like double in intensity to execute at that level and create that value in that short dimension so how do you think teams can make great first impressions when they're starting a new engagement with the customer you know first of all give those first engagements and or sort of the onboarding the importance that it deserves you start with their intent you, if you treat it as important you will do everything it has to start with that if you don't have the intent correctly that this is like by far the most important first impression or whatever you want to call it like they have to put the best foot forward uh, that part has to be there in intent from the top then it obviously boils down to whether you got that process defined and structured for the type of customer that you are onboarding a small and medium business i mean a small deployment will have a different sort of call it almost a template for onboarding versus a more complex customer multi division customer and that that differentiation should be clear and that template should be clear in that onboarding team uh and might vary by product as well but you know i think in general you got to be able to have that sense of there is a difference between this type of deployment versus that type of deployment right and the third it boils down to you know creating the underlying communication or information sharing infrastructure that is persistent real time and sort of many to many communication i mean uh, emails are hard to do that right when people do this in excel spreadsheets whatever it's hard to do that because there is the element of collaboration sits outside of that base mechanism i mean you will use comments etc not exactly the way how people collaborate right especially if you have distributed teams you have remote teams that that collaboration element or sort of you call it communication collaboration that infrastructure has to be there if you don't then despite the good intent despite the 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 structured template you will see lots of overhead in that right and then obviously sort of the last you can't take the human element out of that right which is you have all of these but you got to have the human who is able to sort of still run and execute the process right so that is something that these four are sort of the you know what i call the four lego blocks that you got to put together to deliver the right foundation for onboarding you get a few of these wrong maybe there's a superhuman who can get over some of these but you don't want to build for superheroes you got to build for good individuals who should be able to do this without superhuman effort right so how do you make it more repeatable all of that boils down to making it structured enough that you can repeat it right right so hero driven to system driven as they say makes sense yeah yeah cool i, I think you know latching on to one of the things you mentioned which was you know there are more of these multi department sort of purchases that are happening and one of the problems you mentioned in the past was you know the group that buys may end up being different from the group that needs to use a piece of software so how do you 
as as a vendor uh, how do you sort of ensure you're not getting it falling into that trap yeah i mean so it's typically there is one group that is quote unquote making the buy decision because that sort of fits their requirements and then there's another group who's been dragged on because whoever is either the business unit or somebody who's basically said this is the platform of choice for us and i'm like hey you haven't sold to me or you haven't included me you haven't taken my requirements into view right and so it's important to be aware that there are this differences or there are different individuals or different groups who are in this first if you understand that then you're going in with that awareness you're not blind to that um once you are aware of that the onus is on the saas vendor or the platform vendor whatever you want to call yourself to redeclare what has been bought so in other words sort of set the saying hey this is what i've come with what i've been told to deliver now that at least enables these other groups to say oh 7 out of 10 meet my criteria these three i need tweaking right because it, it's hard to go and start of not i mean it's going to be very hard from an execution standpoint to go and open the entire requirement list it's, it's usually very dangerous to do that in that because they'll say hey if you go and ask them they'll take 6 months to sort of come up with their requirements instead you want to say this is what i've been told these are 7 out of 10 that matches now let me find out those three that don't match or those are additional because usually that will be stuff that you wouldn't have conceived up front right but if you got to almost declare this is what you are buying mr customer and get that 7 out of 10 match and the onus in my view is on the vendor to engage with these buyer groups know who those buyer groups are recognize them very quickly and then say okay let me get that match and then start the conversation otherwise you're going to get complete resistance from them and it will be passive aggressiveness and or passive resistance they're not going to sort of oppose but they will not adopt which kills your business got it so one of the things you mentioned earlier deepak was that the intent needs to be there to know that you know the, the start of the project is really important and you know you need to go in with that intensity what are some tips and tricks that you've employed over the years to ensure that your team carries that you know right intensity and uh intent behind how they engage i don't know if there are some sort of like bag of tricks or whatever but one thing that i have found very useful is to get them to focus on a set of metrics and and i've used traditionally the the simplest of the metrics and i like to think the cfos have done a very good job of sort of laying out right i mean they are driven by revenue and and in many ways it's a very hard tangible measurable number right so when onboarding fails or doesn't succeed it shows up on revenue it will show up on churn subsequently but up front it will show up on revenue so if you got your head wrapped around or you got your team to focus on time to revenue ttr right then it instantly puts a lot of emphasis for the deployment teams that this is important because now there's a actual metric that has meaningful business impact that is put there that is sort of what i call the the dollar sense number and then the other side is the nps if you put sheet sort of some metrics then metrics in a way help you drive the appropriate intent and the intensity that comes along with that right because now you are saying that's what i'm measuring you on and so it puts you know you don't walk in and say up oh, i'll think about how i'm going to if you don't measure it you can't improve it you can't you can't see how well you're doing or whatever you can so you put some metrics that will put some elements of specificity around how well you're doing that process and i that actually those two have helped me immensely 
right? Um, and then there's a softer, what I call non-metric driven, which is engagement with the customer, which is what your customer success folks should be doing, which is engaging with the customer and getting sort of the soft pulse. I mean, your NPS will give you your hard pulse, but you got to be able to sort of read behind the number and see what is causing that. And so that engagement is sort of a under the cover and you got to have that sense of, hey, are we in the right track or are we not? And so those would be sort of the things that create the intensity of, yeah, I, I think those, those have helped me in saying, we're not going to miss some of these. And you measure those, you track those on a regular basis. Results usually accompany that. So having worked a lot with large enterprises, how do you sort of right size your landing in the land and expand to ensure that, you know, successful value delivery happens faster and it's also going to lead to expansion. Um, any risks that you also see with like different kinds of, you know, sizing how you enter into a customer? Obviously, you know, uh, for your land and expand motion to come out and be running in good cadence, you got to have a sense of what kind of customer that is. And so very early on in the cycle, uh, at least when, you know, from a customer success standpoint, we try to get the customer to be profiled upfront and get a sense of what the size of the price is with that customer, All right? Uh, Land of Expand is simply taking more wallet share, right? What is, so you have to know what the size of the wallet is before you can define what the wallet share is, right? And so you have to take an attempt at defining the size of the price. And I can tell you right up front, you will get that wrong or you'll be off that mark. But it is at least a stake in the ground that you're putting, which, which sort of, again, gives you a sense of, is this a quick deployment SNB customer where I'm going to deploy and, and there's not much more that I can do? Or am I going to put some create, uh, I'm going to enable myself to grow within that customer because it is a large potential customer. So your engagement dimensions also change when you have a view of that. And so I usually ask my CSMs if you're doing account reviews or et cetera, I used to say, tell me what the size of the price is for this customer. Let's say in a hypothetical world, the customer was super happy with our deployment, loved our product, is this a customer going to be able to spend 100,000 with us with the products that we have today or with you know our product set? Are they going to spend 100,000 with us or they are, could they spend a million dollars with us? Now, it's usually, you know, you don't get a good answer up initially in the first set of reviews because you haven't asked that question and they haven't thought through that as, as a, because they're probably, you know, saying, okay, let me get this deployed, whatever, right? But I think that is an important question to ask uh, so that you can orient yourself around how do I land and expand? I mean, the expand motion has to come in. But keep in mind, you can't be all focused on expansion without actually delivering the value and getting your adoption and usage on the base. And so, you know, Customer, I mean, uh, customer success folks would say, oh, should I focus on it? No, 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 no. It's almost like you got to get your base correct, get the experience right first before you start to think. But it's almost like you got to be able to say, this is my long-term view of what that customer could be and I'm going to do. In many cases, if you don't, again, have a view of where you're going, then you're going to end up not going there. So that's what I usually ask. It's a provocative question. It's hard to answer because you might not know the customer in depth, but it at least focuses you to think about that question next time you're engaging with the customer is what else is out there? Right. Makes sense. And, and how do you uh, help your team sort of right size what that initial land should be? Is, is there any thoughts you have around here? If, if the overall size is going to be so much, then don't try to chew all of it. Take like 
so much percentage as the first chunk or any any sort of i mean i don't know if there is sort of uh, a formulaic way to do that but you know customers have a certain appetite for consumption i mean there certainly the sort of the high level budget view but also in terms of how fast they can consume right um uh, you know we talked about is the org ready for that consumption and that gives you a good view of if they are going to be uh, they're going to be paying dollar the assumption is that they're going to be able to consume that otherwise you they wouldn't sign that up right but so there's no formula like way to say you got to start with 10% and get to 100% i don't think that there is a sort of a a way to do that uh, but you always have to have a sense of okay this is what the customer is able to consume today and 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 that's a good place and you'll get that sense from from each type of customer so i haven't gone in with the mindset that i want to get 30% of the business up front and then 70% up you know subsequently and then once you have the sort of the size of the price view then you can figure out how much you can expand the consumption um and what else are the barriers for that consumption i mean if they are in another contract that runs for another 2 years then even though the size of the price is high and the customer loves your product they're not going to be able to consume because presumably they will not be able to break that contract but it's an interesting question i haven't thought about it in that dimension though maybe there is i mean from your answer it feels like uh maybe there is a questionnaire or a checklist or something that helps csms arrive at a view of like what is the readiness of this customer correct i i do think there is a huge value in you know creating that view of the customer readiness to adopt your product or your platform there is that's a very very programmatic way to do it like you know we do what's called as a customer 360 i've done this you know across multiple of my roles uh, we used to do what's called as a customer 360 which is some definition of taking the 360 degree view of that relationship that you are going to have with a customer or you already have with a customer and some of the questions that we used to ask in that i mean it's just a we used to have it as a spreadsheet but you can think of it like a checklist is are they making you the platform of choice or are you the platform of choice for everything that they do in your domain um is their executive connect because as you start to sell bigger you know dollar value then you need to have some of those um are we the the target architecture do we fit in their target architecture that they have because many of the businesses whether they are cios or you know business unit heads they have a view of what their in state architecture looks like from what type of applications they are consuming what kind of you know infrastructure they have they have a view whether that i mean and you have to see whether you fit in that view or not and so we have that and we try to get to a score now we use that traditionally to scope out growth to existing potential um, as well as churn risk but it's actually a very good way to also explore are they going to be even ready for consuming your product and maybe it is worthwhile to do that very early in the onboarding cycle we typically do it like after the onboarding is complete and we have a few months of uh, sort of you know usage in there probably worthwhile to do sort of these checks actually it's a very very interesting point three i hadn't thought about it at all if you had to share some advice with a new cs leader who's picking up a business which is staring at a little bit of low adoption and potential churn uh, where do you think they should start low adoption in my view is a uh, emblematic of engagement uh, right you know call me a traditionalist or an old school uh, i believe customer engagement in itself is sort of the the bedrock on which you build everything else uh and so i look at it and say when do i not adopt a platform yes the feature functionality usage usually is is a is a big driver of that but i don't adopt the platform if i'm not engaged with that 
platform or the individuals of that platform. Usually, how do I think about it? When do I stop engaging with using a particular uh, SaaS product? Is I will I I would have bought that, or somebody would have bought that with a view of what that will deliver to me as value. I have been using the product and I'm not getting that value. Usually, you will have a good one, two, three shots at fixing that. In some cases, you'll find that your use case that the customer is trying to solve for and the product use case don't match. And then there's really nothing you can do and it's going to churn, right? But if assuming that that is there and that's where you started with, then it's usually a few elements that are off. And if you want to go fix those elements, you have to first engage with the customer and figure out why they are not able to get that usage, uh, right? And the engagement doesn't have to be face-to-face -face or person-to-person, -person, but you'll actually get a view of that engagement with the product very easily. I mean, your logins is a good way to sort of a early proxy for your engagement, right? So focus on what your engagement is first. And then if your engagement parameters are off, uh, then you got to be all in in creating a human connection because you got to get to what is actually breaking in that engage. Why is the customer not engaging? And that's where the customer success person is invaluable in trying to get to that and understand why. If you've got those two correctly, I believe most of your what are called avoidable churn will be in control. And I say most because there will be some churn. I mean, that churn is a fact of life, right? But avoidable or controllable churn. In other words, if you did something, you could have controlled it or mitigated it mightily. You'll be able to do that. So it generally, we break our churn down into what is controllable churn, uncontrollable churn. And we also measure, do we have engagement with that customer? right? And because that tells you whether you can actually recover the situation. There'll be customers who will just not engage with you and they're gone. And so even though the churn might happen four quarters from now, because they're in contract, really nothing else. I mean, they've just stopped engaging with you. So I always start with the bedrock, which is, are you able to engage with the customer? Because you'll get everything that you want to know about what your product is not solving for or why the use case in engaging with the customer. So that's what I would say. Any CS individual has to start not with a renewal in focus in mind, but or anything, any other metric in mind, but to say, am I engaging with my customer base, with the portfolio of accounts that I've been asked to manage? Am I engaging with them or not? That's a very useful way to think about it, people. Uh, we now move to the next section of our show, which is a rapid fire section. Okay. I have some interesting questions lined up. Uh, what's one habit that you picked up in 2020 that you'll continue in 2021? One habit that is more related to sort of uh, personal life, uh, which is um, I've actually become far more uh, disciplined about my, uh, about the passion that I have, which is hiking. Right? I have just gotten extremely disciplined about it. Uh, and I think I picked that up obviously during the pandemic. Um, but And I expect to continue this for the rest of my life. And I think it's now sort of, I'm hoping it's ingrained in my DNA now that I'm not going to leave that. The other thing that I've done, which I uh, picked up um, is um, in addition to sort of having formal reviews and such, you know, formal sync ups, what I have elevated during the, the pandemic, especially with my direct reportees, is what I call sort of informal engagement, more elevated. Um, um, I guess the need for that was less because I would travel to, let's say if my team was in Bangalore, I would travel to Bangalore, spend two weeks. So therefore I felt that I had that connection. Now, obviously with travel sort of out of the picture for the last year, I had to find sort of another informal way to engage with my team 
that is not driven off of a review or uh, something that you are doing as part of your cadence so you got to almost sort of find a way to connect with them and it's opened some vistas for me as an individual in getting to know my team far better in a different context then i think it's helped me as a as an individual certainly i think help me in my sort of how i think about leadership in general so i think that is something that i would probably carry on put more emphasis even if i were to travel back find a way to you know have this informal engagement more so than what i had did in the years past got it okay here here's the next question deepak what's one metric that you live by net retention rate right i mean that's sort of how i think about um, because it captures very effectively the churn renewal and growth um, i also care about customer engagement since you asked me one metric it's a uh, you know i had to pick nrr because it's sort of like the outcome metric which probably captures nps or engagement in many ways got it nice what do you think is your superpower at work it's almost like what what could be your what's your you know weapon of choice so to say <laughs> um but um i think from my team perspective the ability to get them to rally around a a particular set of metrics or goals not just by pointing out to some metrics i mean it's almost you know i i use this uh, statement with my team and and i found over the years that has worked very well which is uh, i say that i will not ask you to do anything that i won't do myself right i say that because i say i have to lead by example and i have to do what i have to do um including at the more uh, ground level right um because that makes us as a team that is going in that same direction versus me pointing and saying or you know saying you know you do this no it's actually we do this and so it's it's a very very helpful thing and the other one that i say is that you know the upside is for is the teams or the individuals in the teams the downside is me as as the leader i basically take the downside away from the team right and those two things have helped me create enormous bonds with my teams that we've gone after some hairy goals and we've executed so i would say ability to build a team that is focused sort of like a we mentality and then also that plays with a little bit of you know no fear attitude i don't know that's if right. i answered that because i have not thought about it as like what's my superpower at work but yeah no i think that, that that's a good one uh, that's a good answer i liked it cool uh, we now move to the last section of our show uh, we have some questions coming in from our audience on our slack community for rocket lane as well as uh, from twitter so here's the first one as the chief customer officer how do you pick which customers you spend time with so there are some customers where i am i'm personally interested in their business there's something about their business that attracts me right um it could be just because they are in a in a particular vertical or they're doing something unique in their business or they have a unique strategy so when i engage with that customer i'm not just engaging as to what you know aryaka can do for that customer but i'm also trying to see how i can enable them to sort of achieve what they are trying to do disproportionately in their business right um, and so that actually sort of naturally gravitates me to a few set of customers where i'm enamored by the goal they themselves are chasing and i feel we as aryaka can contribute towards that goal and so i spend some time with those customers um we're also obviously motivated by growth uh, and so i tend to focus on customers that have huge potential I and mean, it's a sort of use case fit is there but we are not able to crack it and it's like a bit of a challenge and i would say 
there are a set of customers that every quarter I do this, which is we go and say, uh, these are customers that uh, we don't want to lose. I mean, part of my job is to make sure, you know, they stay with Ariaka for life. Um, so there are a set of customers where we go and say, we're not going to lose these customers. And it's not necessarily driven by the MRR value, but sometimes I go and say, this customer, we don't want to lose. I mean, there'll be some, you know, there are, it's a good brand or something that it's unique, something fantastic we're doing with that customer. And we are not, we shouldn't be losing that customer kind of a thing, right? And so I'll spend a lot of time engaging with those customers because I really want to be able to work alongside the CSM who's managing that customer to get to sort of the down the weeds to see why are we in a position that we are even potentially losing this customer and what can we do to turn that out? So the sort of like those three big buckets where I spend my time. Uh, somewhere I'm enamored by their business itself. Somewhere there's huge growth. So obviously we'll be all over that. And some customers where we feel we shouldn't lose this customer. So we're not we refuse to die kind of a attitude. So that's how I sort of split. And it changes every quarter between these three. Got it. Nice. Uh, here's the next one. Uh, what do you believe are the top three traits of a good customer success leader? You have to be passionate about being in front of customers. I mean, customer success is uh, heavy customer engagement driven. So you got to be able to, you know, uh, be in front of a customer and that should inherently, you know, drive up your uh, adrenaline. If you're not, then you're not the right customer success leader because this is inherent trait, right? Uh, so that's something that is very important. Uh, you have to be very passionate about your product, right? That passion should be, I don't want to call it maniacal, but it's almost like you've got to believe that you are changing the world because of that. You have to be deeply passionate. You'll see product folks deeply passionate about those. Founders are deeply passionate about what they're building, right? Customer success folks have to be right up there with them in that passion that they have, right? Uh, and so that's that's very important. Third thing is that you have to have a view of what value are you adding to the customer? Okay. Customer has a perceived value. Your product teams obviously think they're adding a certain amount of value, but you almost have to be the true judge because you'll have customers who will be over-indexed on one side, whereas your product people might be saying, wow, we are adding tremendous amount of value but in reality it might be somewhere lower in some cases. So I think you have to have a true sense of the value that you're adding to the customer and that barometer should be internal. And that's what you got to drive. You got to bridge these two sort of potentially, I mean, if both of them are in the same, you know, zip code, great, but if they're in two zip codes and they are far apart, then it's the responsibility of the customer success folks to bring those. And so you have to have that, value parameter yourself right so that you can you can bridge that uh, here th here's our last question for the day um, you worked on uh, customer service uh, product in the past do you have any tips to working with customers on projects that are more cost saving in nature than like adding to the top line usually <laughs> top line driven projects tend to have a little bit more self momentum if you want to say right because top line generally trumps cost savings not that cost savings are bad or you know not, they are very very important but generally enabling top line growth automatically has a different sort of intensity bucket right whereas cost savings will be for one group, the other group might not be as motivated by that same cost savings because they tend to be a little more diffuse. So that's the only difference that I can, if you were to push me hard and say, what's the difference? Those would be sort of the only way I think about them because they generally have a little bit more momentum on their own side by their own self. Right. So I, I, I'm taking that as you need to provide that extra momentum and, and push then if you're working on the yes. you know cost, cost saving side. side yeah got it perfect 
thank you so much deepak this was really fun having you talk to us on on all of these uh, topics we, we really enjoyed it awesome thank you and thank you for the opportunity it's it's fun you know you guys are trying to solve a very unique problem so i am love to be engaged and see how we can exchange ideas thank you for the opportunity thank you